Thank you for coming to my master's lecture recital. Today I will be talking about and playing Prokofiev's seventh piano sonata. And this will be with a particular influence of, um, or particular emphasis on the neoclassical influences and especially Beethoven's influence on this sonata. So just a quick overview of Sergei Prokofiev. He was born in 1891 and died in 1953. Uh, actually happened to die on the same day as Joseph Stalin, and unfortunately because of that, many people didn't notice that Prokofiev died until much later. However, some notable people actually did choose to attend Prokofiev's funeral instead of Stalin's, like his fellow composer, uh, Dmitry Shostakovich. Prokofiev was known for having a very distinct musical style that was characterized by angular disjunct melodies, uh, unusual chordal juxtapositions, and including wrong notes in those chords at times. And there is also a very uh, distinct uh, motoric rhythm that appears in much of his uh, works, especially quick works. One of the things that you'll actually hear in this sonata in particular is that juxtaposition of chords that are uh, unusual relationship to one another. In this case, you have an F sharp minor chord and a C minor chord. However, he does add long notes to each of those by raising the top voice and down here. So in that case, you see this tritone relationship between the two chords. And this is actually something that Prokofiev uses with chords within the piece, and you actually see it in key relationships um, between movements, as you'll see in this sonata. He usually composed in neoclassical forms, which this refers to basically just the structures and the classical structures that he, uh, or the genres that he wrote in. And so that would be like Baroque dances, uh, piano sonatas, concerti, symphonies, opera, ballet. These types of um, these types of pieces are really what Prokofiev composed for most of his life. Which, uh, in the 20th century, a lot of musicians had moved away from that. So, quick overview of neoclassicism. You know, uh, some say that this was uh, inspired by a desire to find order in a world of chaos, especially surrounding the First and Second World Wars, which the world had never seen anything like that. Um, so this movement was usually through the genres, as I talked about with Prokofiev. These older genres that were perhaps maintained through tradition or even forgotten about, like some Baroque dances that uh, most Romantic composers did not touch in the 19th century. However, you see a resurgence of these suites and old style uh, with some of these neoclassical composers. In Russia in particular, the harmony uh, was fairly non-traditional because there was a, you know, a desire for a distinct harmonic style, as you see with um, Prokofiev and Shostakovich. However, outside of Russia, that meant um, that it was expanded to atonal works, uh, particularly with Schoenberg. You see he has a suite in uh, old style that was 25, where that uses his 12 tone. Um, style of writing. However, in Russia, it was mainly centered around tonal um, works, for the most part. One of the biggest things that you saw in Russia in the beginning of the 20th century was a resurgence of the piano sonata genre. We all know that Beethoven was perhaps the biggest uh, composer of the piano sonata, uh, writing 32 of them. Schubert, around the same time and a little bit after him, wrote many piano sonatas, but during the Romantic era, the number of sonatas fell off greatly, and then in the early 20th century in Russia, you see composers writing more and more piano sonatas. As in, you see here, Scraven wrote 10 of them, Matner 14, Prokofiev and Yanskarsky both published nine. Most of the traditions for these sonatas either can be traced back to Beethoven or Liszt. List of um, writing in the Romantic era created basically the standard for a Romantic um, sonatas, which was a single movement of a usually larger scale, rather than multi-movement works that Beethoven often published. Of these, uh, Prokofiev, probably the most 
maintained the Beethoven style of writing. He, of his nine piano sonatas, only wrote two of them in a single movement. Another thing that um, musicologist Gary O'Shea mentions is Beethoven's ten, uh, tendency to publish multiple sonatas at a time. You see that some with Mender and Prokofiev, um, Mender actually publishing within one opus number multiple sonatas as Beethoven sometimes did. However, Prokofiev's sonatas all have their own opus number. One thing that is similar is his uh, three war sonatas. Um, these are published with late, they are late sonatas published with consecutive opus numbers, much like Beethoven's final trilogy. Miaskowski, interestingly, actually was a close friend of Prokofiev and also published this with the same opus numbers, three sonatas, opus 82, 83, and 84. However, for Miaskowski, those are his 7th, 8th, and 9th, rather than his 6th, 7th, and 8th sonatas. Uh, another interesting thing that you'll find with the Russian tradition and Beethoven in particular is that F minor was a very important key for Beethoven's sonatas, given that there's only two, and those are his very first sonata, as well as his famous Appassionata sonata, which was held in ver very high regard in uh, the Soviet Union. There's actually a story of the pianist Isaiah Doverbin, um, who played for Vladimir Lenin, the Appassionata, and he famously called it the greatest piece ever written. I say that because Scriabin, Metner, and Prokofiev all published their first piano sonatas in F minor, and this is possibly because of the influence that Beethoven had on the Russian tradition of teaching. So Beethoven was uh, very interesting to Prokofiev at a very young age because his mother was taking piano lessons and mainly studied the works of Beethoven and Chopin. Uh, Prokofiev took a liking to Beethoven and often or performed in recital, because he was a performing pianist, not just a composer, he often performed Beethoven's works alongside his own, and his sonatas are characterized usually by being multi-movements and having great amounts of motivic development, which is something that Beethoven is also famous for. So these war sonatas, uh, like the one that I'll be playing today, the seventh, these were written during World War II, the seventh sonata was written between 1939 and 1942 and premiered by Richter, who famously learned it in only four days before performing it. Uh, something interesting to note here is that the musicologist Gary Bichet also mentions that these three sonatas all have some iteration of the famous fate motif of Beethoven, which serves as a kind of unifying factor across these three sonatas. So the structure of the seventh sonata, it is, in, it is in three movements, which you actually see Prokofiev writing three movement sonatas more often than uh, some of those other Russian composers writing sonatas I mentioned. Scriabin had zero three movement sonatas, and Metner only has one of his 14. Uh, the seventh sonata um, follows a standard classical tradition of fast, slow, and fast again with the first movement being the longest in, and it is in sonata allegro form, then having a ternary form, A, B, A, uh, middle movement, as well as a fiery, exciting third movement that is in rondo form. With this first movement, we'll see here that there are three main motifs that are used to construct basically this entire movement. There is a French musicologist, Romain Roland, who claims that the second and third motif that you see here both stem from Beethoven, actually specifically the Appassionata sonata. He claims here that this, you can see the first, yes, that these galloping thirds actually are somehow related to some thirds that you see in the Appassionata. Of course, in Prokofiev, it sounds like with the Appassionata that he mentions that it is Now, literally, it seems almost a bit of a stretch to connect those. However, you can hear texturally how there might be a similarity with those thirds there. The second motif that you see there is serves a rather percussive purpose at the beginning of the piece, 
but it uh, is expanded into other forms as we go throughout this first movement, and this is the famous fate motif that appears in the Apostolic Sonata, as well as his fifth symphony. You can see in the top right corner that this, this is the fate motif as it appears in the Apostolic Then over here, this is how it appears at one point in the seventh sonata of the Corpio in the first movement. Notice how he writes the quasi timpani marking, which Roland claims is even greater um, evidence of suggesting that this was inspired by Beethoven, given that this motif was also heavily prevalent in the Fifth Symphony. You see also that this fate motif is used at the beginning of the slow theme in the first movement. Another interesting area of um, really controversy here regarding the first movement is how it's structured with the end of the development and the beginning of the recapitulation. Behrman, as well as other uh, doctoral thesis, um, thesis, there are theses that are published, claim that this uh, development actually ends around measure 33, which for, just for reference, is just before this. Uh, and that, once we arrive there in the piece, that is absolutely, without a doubt, part of the recap, not the development. There are also sources that say that the development must be shorter because the recap actually begins much, much earlier, about halfway through the piece, when we have this. Which is exactly as we saw earlier. The problem with this is that that would put the uh, development of this piece at a, just under a page long, and that entire section of material happens to be repeated just after the, uh, re the recap begins. However, the error with this thinking is that the recap must only begin after the development ends. What Prokofiev is most likely doing in this sonata is simultaneously um, having the uh, the recap and the development overlapping with each other. One thing that's actually particularly interesting here is that uh, by the time we reach the very clear section of the recap that is no longer being developed, we are no longer at the first, um, the first theme. We are somewhere in the middle of the recap. There are no instances that I found of Beethoven or classical composers doing this. However, you do see this with Chopin. Um, not that he actually combines the recap and development, but just that he has the development, then cuts the recap off by entering in the middle rather than starting from the beginning. Another thing that we see here is a repeated motif that appears for an entire page of music. Now, usually at the end of a development, you would see some sort of pedal point, usually a dominant pedal. Beethoven started to stray from this an example is in his Pastoral Sonata, which is in D major, rather than having a pedal point on A, he emphasizes F sharp major, which is the dominant of the relative minor. Another thing that you see, for, or that you see Beethoven doing there is very heavy um, motivic. Uh, elements repeating for almost an entire page of music. And in this case, uh, Prokofiev isn't using a, like, so to speak, a tonal pedal. However, it is likely that given that this appears near the end of the, um, the development, that this may serve the purpose of acting as some sort of indication that the development is ending. In this case, we have the Beethoven, which sounds as such. Uh, and this actually comes from the, directly from the beginning of the piece. So that moment at the end of the, the first theme is that motif that he uses to create this uh, dominant, well, I say dominant, but we already established that it's not the dominant of the this pedal at the end of the development. Moving on to the second movement, the first thing that we would notice here is that it is in 
E major. Now this is important because we already talked about this tritone relationship that Prokofiev loves to use. And we saw it earlier between two chords in F sharp minor and C minor. Immediately after that, he actually plays the similar things in B flat minor and E minor. So again, this tritone relationship. Another interesting thing is that Beethoven also used E major in uh, unrelated keys, essentially, in of middle movements. For example, his uh, sonata, num opus two, number three, in C major, the second movement, begins in E major. So while it's not the same tritone relationship, it is possibly a tribute to Beethoven having this unrelated key that appears in E major. This actually comes from a Schumann piece, um, Weimut, which roughly translates to sadness or um, melancholy. You can actually see the vocal line is a Part. It isn't very revealing of the similarity, but when you hear the interval in the piano, it's very similar to So you can hear those tents in the piano. They have a very distinct sound that he seems to use here. No one, when this was premiered, actually noticed this, and that would have actually, if it had been noticed, possibly put Prokofiev at some risk of getting in trouble with the government, who had recently commissioned him to write a celebratory piece celebrating Stalin, and shortly after that he publishes a uh, work with this, called Sadness, essentially. The third movement we see here is a Toccata in Rondo form. Beethoven uh, was known for having very some some very energetic um, final movements of the sonatas, and Prokofiev was fascinated by this. And he also usually put his finales in rondo form. In this case, it is a simple version of the rondo form, going A B C B A, but it is certainly in line with the uh, toccata aspect of it. One of one sonata that you could look at in particular is the Beethoven Opus 26 sonata, which the last movement of is almost entirely 16th notes and is um, a few minutes long at most. The Toccata is another interesting point of neoclassicism where uh, Prokofiev uh, actually wrote more than one Toccata, but this one being one of them and another one being the actual published Toccata Opus 11. This is a style of writing that actually really didn't disappear from uh, the piano repertoire. You saw Schumann in the Romantic era writing a Toccata. Before that, you had plenty of Toccatas by Bach and Baroque composers. And then even in the 20th century, you have some examples of Toccatas. Uh, possibly the reason for it not going away is it is very performer-friendly in that it allows a pianist to show off their skills, which is what pianists often like to do. Another thing that you see here in the third movement during the B section is this circular type of pattern with this uh, C major dotted rhythm. This actually relates back to the first movement uh, when you have in the first movement. It's just circling around the C major thing and then later. to insert these C major chords in places where they seemingly don't belong. And he actually does that also in the end of the second movement with this. And while that one doesn't have the dotted rhythm, there is actually a earlier um, iteration of that similar material where it does have the dotted rhythm, which could be a um, showing a relationship between the material, between sonatas. Now, Beethoven um, was known for using some examples of cross-movement um, material. For example, like at the end of his second movement of his Emperor Concerto, he actually slowly previews the theme that appears at the beginning of the third movement. Moving on to the overall structure, we see here that this has a telescopic structure 
as uh, O'Shea calls it, and that the movements get smaller as they go along. And a particular example of Beethoven's that you can look at is the F major sonata opus 10, number two, which has a very similar structure. And now I will perform this piece for you. After it's more.
much, and I play for you again soon, and have a good evening.